You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Okay, all of you, call us now. Chris is with us on 021-446-0567, Chris, I can't wait to get into the story about antibiotics, but just very quickly to conclude the conversation I was having with my listeners earlier. We, um, we've we been discussing our president, Jacob Zuma, who giggles uh, way too much, many think, in Parliament, when he's being asked serious questions, he giggles. In interviews, when he's being asked serious questions, he giggles. And I read an article that says um, uh, that nervous laughter has been noted to occur in many psychological experiments. It talks about people laughing to conceal anxiety and, and, and nervousness. What do you say about that? Is there some, some study, some understanding of what laughter means at what we deem to be inappropriate times? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think you've answered the question, Reedy. You answered it better than I can. Um, I mean, the, the bottom line is people probably do this and giggle in order to dis- detract from a problem that they don't want to talk about or to uh, draw people's attention away from an area that they think is sensitive, that, that they're worried about, or because, as you said, they have some kind of social anxiety or some other kind of anxiety around discussing the topic. I, I agree with you. Um, some people probably do it more than others. Mm-hmm. I suspect it's also something you can learn not to do. Yes. Because I remember that when I first started sort of making radio programs and things, I used to do and say a lot of stuff in a way that didn't turn into very good radio. And as I got more practiced and just had more experience and learned to be more relaxed about doing it, then you have more thinking time. Uh, and if you have more thinking time, then you can plan ahead in your own mind mm-hmm. things you're going to say next much better. And so they come out right the first time round, not the tenth time round. Okay. So there, you see, what stands out for me, it's something that you can learn not to do. You can unlearn that. So, Chris, we've spoken about antibiotics before. There's been a lot of research. We've, we've interviewed people here in South Africa when there was a report that came through uh, that there are some drug resistant, there are some uh, b- bacteria showing resistance to antibiotics. Is there something new in this particular uh, debate? Yes. The... Chinese have been watching what's happening on their farms and testing for various types of antibiotic resistance just routinely. And a rather worrying paper has come out in the medical journal The Lancet this week from researchers at Beijing University. And what they have discovered is that there is circulating in certainly parts of southern and southeastern China a strain of the bacterium E. coli, which has evolved to become resistant in a transferable way. In other words, the bacteria can share the resistance among them very efficiently to a drug called colistin, which is a member of a family of drugs which we regard as antibiotics Mm. of last resort. In other words, we don't use them often, but when we do have to use them, we have to use them with very good reason because the bugs we're trying to treat with them effectively are resistant to every other antibiotic. So the fact that now what the Chinese have discovered is a bacterium which can break through our last line of antibiotic defense, that's very scary. The other thing that's very scary is Mm. that in their paper, they highlight the fact that uh, the world consumes something like 12,000 tons of antibiotics which are given to farm animals every year a very large proportion of that 12,000 tonnes of antibiotics and colistin specifically go into farm animals Mm. in China. And so they are linking this excessive agricultural use of antibiotics, which are also used by humans in agriculture, and showing that this is probably driving the emergence of these resistant bacteria, which then, of course, can pose a threat to humans. So it's kind of a wake-up call to us that... Uh, this is happening, and the more antibiotics we use, the more resistance we're going to see. So we absolutely need to be more cautious and take action now. Mm, and in reaction to that, another article uh, landed in my inbox talking about how growing resistance to antibiotics is indeed a global problem following this study, but that it is particularly acute in Africa because of our extensive use of pharmaceutical drugs to combat our high disease burdens. Uh, burden. So, Chris, there'll be areas in the world that are more vulnerable than others? There is certainly going to be areas of the world where what we call the antimicrobial stewardship is going to be poorer. 
what do we mean by antimicrobial stewardship? Well, this is where, when drugs are given out, they're given out in a specific way and the right combinations of drugs are used to treat the right infections and there is policing, if you like, of making sure people take the right drug for the right amount of time and that the right sort of drug is given for the right sort of infection. It would be very easy to just give what we call broad-spectrum antibiotics, which are drugs that kill everything, mm. for even the most trivial infections. But it goes back to the point I was making, the more antibiotics we use, the more resistance we're going to see. So if we use our best antibiotics against infections that we don't need to be using, big guns antibiotics to treat, we're increasing the risk that we're going to get resistance. Mm. And many countries, including a number of African countries, have very poor antimicrobial stewardship because they don't have systems in place to control for this. And as a result, there's a lot of exposure and, and general misuse of antibiotics into the environment in those countries, which is going to make the likelihood of getting resistant bacteria much higher. All right, so let's go to the lines on 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. We are taking your SMSs as well on 31702 and 31567. Uh, David in Cyril Dean. Good morning, David. Good morning to you. I have a question on antimatter and also dark matter. I would like uh, Chris's opinion on these uh, (laughs) speculative... uh, scientific uh, offerings. Okay, Chris. Well, what do you want me to tell you about antimatter and matter, David? Does it exist? Absolutely. Um, Matter, we know that exists because we're made of it. Antimatter can be thought of as the mirror image of matter, and if the two meet, then they annihilate and they release energy. And, in fact, we use antimatter and we use this annihilation all the time. If, if uh, anyone listening to this has ever gone to the hospital and had, and had a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan, then you've been the beneficiary of antimatter because a positron is the antimatter equivalent of an electron and it's a, effectively a positively charged electron. If a positron and an electron meet, then they annihilate, annihilate and they give off some energy. And we can, make, we can make material that will lead to the creation of positrons in the laboratory and in brain scanners. So they absolutely exist. What we don't know, mm-hmm. and what no scientist will be able to tell you at the moment, is if we look at our universe, we can see that it's made up of material matter. We know, on the basis of our current understanding of physics, that when the universe was created, it should have led to the formation of equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So therefore, where has all the antimatter gone? Everywhere we look in the universe, we, we can't find it. Um, so that's a big problem. And at the moment, we can't explain that one. Thanks so much. Um, uh, who came in first? It was Kim, I think, in Kemp's Bay. Good morning to you, Kim. Good morning, Rudy. How are you doing? Good morning, Chris. Um, I have a question. Um, I'd like to know why snails like... Uh, Often if you leave um, a cigarette out in the ashtray, the snails come and eat the filter of the cigarette. So I wanted to really? know what attracts them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> the snails have a penchant. Is there any particular brand they go for? Or, no, um, I think it's just all of them, yeah. Independent. Any, independent. Any yes. kind of cigarette. What about roll-ups? Do they like those? <laughs> um, I don't know about that. I just know that with the filter of a cigarette, um, yeah, often if I've left them in an ashtray, the snails will come and eat the whole um, yellow bit away. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, snails and slugs are, are pretty omnivorous, actually, although we associate them with eating plants. And yes, they do eat lots of leaves. If a slug or a snail finds a dead slug or a snail, it will eat it. And frequently, if you, if you wander around on the patio where I am and, and accidentally step, step on one, especially at night, and you hear this crunching noise and you know that you, you stood on a snail, the next morning you will find a whole bunch of slugs and snails eating the remains of their, of their brethren that you stood on. So they do have quite a, a varied palate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't think why they would have a particular penchant to the cigarette. I wonder if there's something in the tar that uh, the cigarette... Uh, has in the filter when it's been smoked. And maybe you could do the experiment and you could put down a, lit sti- uh, a, a cigarette that's been smoked, a butt from one of those, and then the butt from a, an unsmoked cigarette, if you can spare one, and see if they're equally interested in the 
unsmoked filter. And it could be that some of the stuff that's been filtered out has particular chemicals in it to which the, the, the slugs and snails have uh, an, a, a predilection to consume them because it, it might just be that, that they're looking for a carbon source and that they can detect that carbon source and they eat it because they think they're going to get something good out of it. I would do the experiment and then come back to us and tell us what you find. Okay, thanks very much, Kim. Thank you. Interesting question. Uh, Thomas, oh, you wanted to take an ad break. Trevor, Rod, in, uh, Rod, Trevor, uh, Gina in Mulder's Drift. I see you coming to you in a moment. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Right, and we're taking your calls on 21 446 011 Rod in Musenberg. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, is that for Rod? I didn't hear it. Yes, uh, it's for you, Rod. <laughs> thanks. Morning, Chris. Um, Chris, I have a... I have a 70-year-old uh, cast iron system in my home. And it's sort of below the water level. You have these rust sort of polyps growing and blisters. And in fact, I've got a, a polyp in my hand here which sort of has little rings on it. What, what would cause that? I mean, it's quite amazing. I didn't quite catch the description clearly enough. Can you just explain? So you've got a 70-year-old system on a toilet, I presume? Yes, yes, a cast Which time. is going to fill with water and empty periodically during the day. So just yes. describe for me again what you're seeing on the inside. There are rust, rust polyps and rust uh, sort of bubbles. Rust? On the, on the surfaces under the, water, under, under the water level, you know? Yeah, sure. Okay, well... When, when iron rusts, what it has to do is, for the metal, the Fe, that's the chemical symbol of iron, has to ionise, and it gives up electrons to other things, and in the process it turns into Fe2 plus ions. Yes. yes. And those Fe2 plus ions associate with some kind of, of, of oppositely charged iron, which then forms the other half of the equation, so it's electrically neutral. Now, in the presence of water, it tends to happen faster because water is a little bit ionized, but is also a very good carrier of ions and other particles. So w- that's why water and moisture tends to be good for encouraging things to rust. Why would it form little bubbles? Well, probably what's happening, or, or blisters, mm. probably what's happening is that you've got a breach in the surface of the iron. Once rusting begins there and it produces some iron salt, those iron salts can dissolve away and you get a little pit. And once you've got a little pit, you've got a bigger surface area for more water to bring in more things, and including oxygen to get in there, and encourage more rusting, because rust is iron oxide. And so once you've breached the surface and you've started the process, it tends to accelerate and ulcerate, if you like, in a, in a focal point, because that's where the process is happening it, it, it most efficiently. And the more it happens, the more metal surface you expose to the rusting process. And so once it gets in and starts a little rusting point, you'll get a bigger and bigger rusting point at that point. Okay. Um, I think that's probably the best I can do. But if you want to send me a picture of what you're seeing yes. um, to chris at nakedscientist.com or tweet it at Naked Scientist, I'll also take a look for you and uh, perhaps even get a chemist to have a look as well. well. That should be interesting. I'm putting you back on hold, Rod, and my producers will then help you uh, with those email addresses or you can send it to us and we pass it on to the Naked Scientist. Trevor in Santon, good morning. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to find out maybe a little bit trivial, but every time I put Tupperware in the dishwasher, when I take it out after it's been cleaned, all the plates and the other dishes in the Tupperware will be dry. But the Tupperware will always still have little water droplets in, no matter what I do. And yet, if I wash the Tupperware in the sink with sunlight and I leave it on the drying rack, the Tupperware dries. Why does it do that? Yeah, it's a nuisance, isn't it? <laughs> the, the most common reason this happens is because of what we call the specific heat capacity. When you put things like cutlery or your plate into the dishwasher, they have the ability to soak up a lot of heat. They, they're not very good, but they're capable of conducting heat and they conduct heat into their interior the plate and get very hot when the dishwasher cycle finishes the plate surrenders the heat back onto its surface which then re-evaporates any water particles that form there as droplets and they disperse off around the dishwasher they tend to disperse off to surfaces which are less capable of re-evaporating them your tupperware is made of plastic 
which is a poor conductor of heat and has a very low specific heat capacity. In other words, it doesn't hold much energy. And as a result, the Tupperware cools down very quickly in the dishwasher relative to the other things which stay hot for longer. And so therefore, while the other things are still evaporating their water off, the Tupperware is providing a nice, convenient, cool surface for the, the water vapor to condense onto. And so the, the Tupperware ends up picking up all the water from all the other stuff in the dishwasher and collecting it for you, and all your plates and knives and forks and spoons go nice and dry. On the dishwashing rack, because there's a whole room to share the water vapor with from the other stuff, then it doesn't preferentially condense on the Tupperware with that not uh, any longer being the coolest thing in the area for it to condense onto. Hmm. Okay. okay. Is it Gina? Yes, Gina, you've been holding on. Gina and Maldestrift, good morning. Hi, good morning. My question is about the cyanobacteria that are infecting all our water sources and whether antibiotics could be used to treat them on a large scale, treat the water, or whether there is anything else that can treat this infection in our water. Yes, cyanobacteria uh, are, are so called because they, well, they, they are often blue green algae. And in fact, they're some of the most primitive forms of life on Earth. You can wind the clock back more than three billion years and you can find some of the uh, earliest vestiges of life were these cyanobacteria. And they have in them photosynthetic pigments. In other words, they can capture light and feed themselves with that light and grow. And they tend to grow on stagnant water or ponds or in water sources where there's a source of light and food. Rather than trying to treat the environment with chemicals to get rid of them, which could be bad because if you put chemicals in to get rid of one thing, then you've got to get rid of the chemicals. Ah. It's far better to try to stop the problem happening in the first place. And so when you end up with alcohol problems and things like that, often it's because of sluggish or slow-moving water contaminated with things that stimulate the growth of these algae. And this often includes sources of nitrogen. So therefore, you're looking for what is contaminating or polluting the water course. And this can also include runoff from farmland and things like that. So rather than try and poison the algae, the best thing to do is to say, well, the algae is like a traffic light. It's telling us something is wrong in the composition of this area and the way the water's moving and, the, and, the, and what's in the water. Let's ask, why has this happened? And why mm. has it happened now, all of a sudden? And is there anything we can do, therefore, to keep the water cleaner, less polluted, and also moving more quickly? And that will help to disperse the algae and stop it building up because the algae are bad because they have various metabolic chemistry going on inside themselves that can make substances and secrete substances into the water, which can be bad for human health. Let's go to Costa in Kilani. Hi. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, Chris, I hope I can articulate this to you uh, properly. I've got a problem with Einsteinian gravity and Newtonian gravity. Uh, the problem that I have is that uh, we understand gravity here on Earth, uh, you know, holding us on the planet. However, uh, uh, I'm saying gravity is, is, is explained differently in that there is no force between the bodies, but rather the warping of the space fabric that keeps large bodies uh, in space in attraction. So how does that apply? I mean, is there a difference at all between the two? And also at the same time, uh, you know, if you apply this gravity uh, in space that keeps the large bodies uh, you know, in, in the point of the moon in its orbit around the, the Earth and, and the Earth around the sun, how does it affect, for instance, a Hades Comet that leaves the solar system and yet when it goes past the Oort cloud and the uh, cover belt, it does come back when it's gone past the Oort cloud? How does that work? Well, gravity is a function of mass. Things which are absolutely massive have gravity. And gravity as Henry Cavendish, who was involved in doing some of these works and actually discovered the, how these gravitational forces and, and um, the, the big constant G that, that dictates how much gravity, uh, gravitational attraction there is between two objects, he discovered that. As he showed, something which is close to something else feels a force because of the mass of that thing. And the, and the force is proportional to how big or massive the thing is. Now that's true regardless of what sort of scale you look at. And the further away from the, the object the weaker the effect of gravity will be because the gravity field weakens the further away you go. Now, Isaac Newton, obviously, all he had to work with was our own solar system. And so he looked at objects that he could 
study the effects on. And he came up with an explanation for gravity and a mathematical explanation for gravity, which on the scale we're dealing with, our cosmic neighbourhood, small objects, relatively speaking, over smallish distances, work fine. But when you extrapolate that to the big scale or the very, very tiny scale, then something goes a bit wrong. And this is where Einstein came along and said, well, actually, look, when we, when we look on different scales, you get different manifestations and different effects. Mm -hmm. And this is, for example, the phenomenon of gravitational lensing. And this is where if you've got something very massive, then it can change the course of light, which is coming from, say, a star behind a big black hole in front of the star the light appears to have travelled on a curved course around the black hole. Light travels in straight lines, it doesn't go around bends. So therefore something was distorting the way that light travelled. And Einstein reconciled that and said, well, the way in which we can explain this is rather than thinking that something big has some gravity and something else has some gravity and the two just pull on each other, mm -hmm. what we can think is that the gravity is that mass in an object deforms the fabric of space. You can think of it like a trampoline surface in two dimensions the gravity the mass deforms the surface of the trampoline and makes us well and you therefore have objects wanting to roll into that well on the trampoline surface towards each other if you think about what happens with these observations of light therefore the light comes through space and it sees a dip or a well in space caused by something with a lot of gravity i.e a big black hole mm -hmm. then the light will actually describe a curved source as it goes around the margins of that dip in the surface of the trampoline. And so we don't think anything's fundamentally different, it's just how we actually describe mm -hmm. it and, and make it work on the grand scale, because Newtonian physics works very well on our scale, but when extrapolated to black holes and stars and huge distances, there were some problems, which Einstein helped to explain. Thank you so much, Chris. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much. We'll speak next week again. Cheers, Rudy. Bye-bye.